Well, my name is Lyle Williams. I'm the curator of prints and drawings, curator of modern art here at the McNair Art Museum. Well, the, the gifts from, from John and Parker Jr. really uh, started in 1994. It goes back a long way in the history of our collection. But in 2017, he gave us a major gift from his collection. And then when he died, of course, he left us the bequest. So it's, um, things came over a period of years from John's collection to the McNay. John was from a prominent San Antonio family. He went to Alamo Heights High School. And in fact, I have friends about John's age who whenever I would, ref would refer to John Parker, they would say, oh yeah, little Johnny Parker. And I could never really quite get used to that. But uh, John came to the McNay with his parents and we used to do an annual sales exhibition called Collector's Gallery. And that's where the director then, John Leeper, would go up to New York and he would select, um, I don't know how many objects, at least 150 or more uh, for sale. And we would put them on exhibition here in one of our gallery spaces. And there would be this huge party and people would drink too much and buy art. And it was a way, it was a very clever sort of underhanded way of sort of seeding collections in San Antonio. You can imagine when, when Leeper arrived in San Antonio in, in the early 1950s, there weren't that many art collectors here. And so he, he saw it as part of the McNay's duty to encourage local collecting. And collector's galleries, one way he did that. And John's parents would come, and John actually made his very first art purchases at collector's gallery at the McNay. So his, his history with us goes back, you know, even farther than his history with me. And I think originally John's plan was to be an artist himself, but I, I think he liked, he was, he was more a curator than he was a, an artist. You know, he appreciated very, very deeply what other people could do. And I think he was happy creating his own, his own collection rather than creating his own work of art. So the, the collection is in fact, his work of art. John had studied at Trinity University here in San Antonio, and he studied with a man named Bob Tiemann, Robert Tiemann, who was, um, I guess we'd call him a minimalist, uh, a minimalist artist who introduced John to a lot of minimalist and conceptualist art, including uh, really one of the great loves of John Parker's life as a collector was Agnes Martin. And in fact, um, some of the earliest drawings we have by John Parker himself are where he's trying to understand the work of Agnes Martin. It's pretty amazing, you know, to see him as a, as a young Trinity student doing drawings after Agnes Martin. But I think what, what the most important thing that Tiemann taught John was to question what art could be and what the definition of art is and how, how far we can take art and still have it read as a work of art. So I think that's one reason why minimalism appealed so much to him, because it's, it's all about just pure form. There's no narrative, uh, no storytelling, no biography, um, and certainly no socio-political content. It's all about line, color, texture, uh, form, and I think that's what appealed to John the most. And he was a very deep thinker, John, um, he read widely, um, he had a very, very sort of simplified life, sort of a minimalist life himself. Uh, he lived in a very simple apartment in Austin, a garage apartment. Down below was his art storage and up above was a, a single room apartment with a separate bathroom, of course, where he had his bed surrounded by bookcases and uh, the most amazing jazz record collection I've ever seen. And those are John's passions, art, books, jazz. That was really, that was really the extent of it. So he really lived his life in a, in a way that, that mirrored the art that he collected. Uh, but the, the other thing that fascinated him was our perception of art. So instead of taking art to the, to, you know, to the abstract, you know, extreme, he was interested in, in, in exploring the ideas of how how we interact with art. And so that's where Jasper Johns comes in. 
because John's, you know, we, we see a work like Jasper John's flag and our brain tells us, oh, that's a flag. But in fact, the only thing John's is working with is lines and shapes and colors and forms on a piece of paper. So, and John's plays with that, that paradox in his work and I think that appealed a lot to John. He collected just about anyone you could you could describe as being a minimalist. You know, there's different definitions about what minimalism is. Sometimes we say minimalist, capital M, is Donald Judd, you know. Minimalist, small M, is, is a lot of other artists whose works did very much the same thing, but who aren't at least philosophically part of that canon. And that includes, you know, Bryce Marden, Robert Ryman, uh, Sala Witt, Agnes Martin, as I mentioned. Uh, those were really the passions of John's, John's life as a collector. And I remember visiting him on numerous occasions. And in his art storage, he, as I said, he lived his life in a very minimalist way. Uh, he had one spoon, one fork, one knife. Uh, we tried to buy him a microwave, but he was afraid of fires. So he wouldn't let us do that. Um, but in his art storage, he had a single chair, and he would sit literally an entire day looking at a single work of art. In fact, the Bryce Martins that I'm looking at on the wall uh, right now, uh, he would sit and look at and just, you know, really get, do a deep dive into a work of art. It's, his philosophy about art was very similar to, to Donald Judd's, and that was it shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't take it for granted. We shouldn't, you know, we all walk through galleries. We're all guilty of this. We all walk through galleries and we pass by amazing works of art and we may look at them a few seconds and then we move on. John was different. John wanted to sit and get to know a single work of art over a long period of time. And that's what the collection is really all about. And I think that's, that's why Judd was so appealing to him because, you know, when Judd founded the, the Chinati Foundation out in Marfa, out in West Texas, he was doing the exact same thing. He was watching an art market, you know, in the 60s and 70s, where prices were going sky high and art was being commodified. And so he said, I want to make art inconvenient and I want to make it difficult for people to come and see this art so that when they, when they do make, you know, however long the track, like six hours, out to Marfa, Texas from San Antonio, when they do make that trek, that they feel that it has been worthwhile. And, uh, you know, they, they get to see that art in that context. I, I don't think that they ever met. Um, I knew, I'm not even sure that John ever went out to Chinati. In fact, I would say no. Uh, we had tried to arrange a trip, but John did not travel that well, uh, as, as you could probably imagine. So it, it was hard to even get John to come to Austin to see exhibitions. And in fact, in, um, so we, we, you know, our relationship with him started in 94. And then in 2000, we did an exhibition drawn largely from John's collection. And we did a modest publication at that time. And it combined things that I had been buying in the minimalist conceptualist area for the collection with significant loans from, from John Parker and we tried to get him to come down to see from you know the life that he had and the life that he enjoyed and so he, he was actually quite a happy person when i tell people that he spent all day looking at a single work of art they think oh that sounds so sad but he was anything but sad he was very content in how he how he lived his life and he really lived it on his own terms and unfortunately, that didn't include a lot of travel, at least not, not when we knew him. So in 94, uh, the woman whose family gave this gallery, Jerry Lawson, uh, we, did a, we did a memorial exhibition to celebrate, to mark and commemorate her bequest. She died in 93, I believe, and uh, she funded my position a number of really, really great works by Jasper John. She was herself a really great collector here in San Antonio, and John knew her. Um, so we did this modest publication, 
And out of the blue, I get this call from, from John Parker, and he's identified himself. I had no idea who he was. And he says, I, I, you know, I was very, very fond of Jerry, and I want to I wanna give something in her memory. And so he gave us a Jack Youngerman drawing and a, a Richard Stankiewicz drawing. And, you know, eventually, when, when someone gives you something really nice like that for a collection, you don't just let the ball drop. You say, hmm. So what else do you have? And so it took, it took a little while, but I eventually got an invitation up to visit with John in Austin and got to see what was, you know, in the collection. It was quite impressive because very few people knew what John was doing. There were some, some collectors, I mean, some uh, dealers in New York who knew what John was buying and collecting. But in terms of those of us in Texas, no one knew. And there's sort of a lesson there for you know future curators. Um, you never know who's watching, and you never know who's keeping tabs on the develops the relationships you develop with important collectors like Jerry Lawson. And you know if you if you treat those legacies well and with respect, then uh, that could lead to other gifts down the road. So that's you know that's sort of how it all happened. I think. I think John appreciated what we had done for Jerry, and he was very fond of her, and so that she was actually the reason for the introduction. The most recent bequest is over 150 objects. And you know, and it also depends on how you count, because John was a great collector in the fact that if an artist had worked in, in series or in suites, he would often collect the entire suite. And in fact, the Agnes Martin suite that's on the wall in the Lawson Gallery now, it's called On a Clear Day. Um, Agnes Martin was not a prolific printmaker. She made just a handful of print projects during her career. Uh, but he called me one day and he said, I've, I've been approached with a conundrum. And I said, he said, I, I don't know what to do. And he said, I could either buy a single Agnes Martin drawing or I could buy all 30 screen prints from On A Clear Day, and they were about the same price. And uh, so, you know, he and I debated it. I actually went to Austin, and you know, I think we went to lunch and talked about it. And eventually, you know, I, I told him, I said, well, I think in really to appreciate this art, you have to see it in the series. You have to see it almost in terms of music, and I think this appealed to John. Uh, you have to think of a lot of this art as theme and variation. And I, I think that really, that really hit the right mark. And so he, he, he passed on the drawing and got the, got the screen prints instead, the full suite. I'll tell you what, what his gift and bequest has done for the McNays collection. It has made us a center for the study of this material, not only in Texas, not only in the region, but in fact for the entire country. So we are now one of the best collections of minimalist and conceptual printmaking uh, to be found really anywhere. It's hard to communicate, you know, the fondness that developed for him over the years. I mean, I knew him for nearly 30 years. And this was someone who, you know, became a part of my life and I became a part of his. And as I said, I have a picture on my phone of when I took my dog up to visit. And my dog is actually standing in front of one of these Judds and one of these Bryce Martins and just admiring and he, he really, he was over the moon about the fact that my dog was appreciating this art. So, you know, he, he had this uh, wonderful sense of humor. He, he could actually be extremely warm and charming and, and uh, friendly, um, but you know, there, you had to pass a test, that's for sure. Um, you had to know what you were talking about when it came to this kind of art, to the kind of art that he was passionate about. And if he, if he for a minute could discern that you, didn't, you weren't up to par, you were not invited back. I mean, he was very, very cut and dry about it. And I remember, you know, a number of times he would meet people and then I would get this very terse email saying, you know, so-and-so, uh, I didn't like so-and-so very much. They don't know much about minimalist art or something to, to that effect, period, John. You know what, it was just very, 
very cut and dry, but it's who he was. So yeah, the, the, the whole point of this exhibition was not only to show some of the masterpieces of, of what John gave us and what he collected, but also this art, you know, seeks to answer that question, what is art? What can art be? How far can we go uh, in terms of abstraction and still have art mean something and mean art? Uh, seem like it is art or you know in terms of you know Jasper Johns who has represented by the gray alphabets in the show which is a real incredible knockout just a masterpiece of you know 20th century American printmaking it's it's how the viewer interacts with art and how we determine what art is and how we perceive art so all of the art in the in the exhibition really does one of those two things the bequest was, was quite large. So we did an exhibition based on the 2017 gift. And this is the first of two exhibitions that we we're doing uh, that focused on the bequest. And so in this one, as I said, I tried to be very, very focused on art that was, you know, about the parameters of, of what art can be, what art is. The next exhibition will include some other works that John collected. Uh, there are a couple of Andy Warhol soup cans, for instance, that people are very excited about. Uh, and I, you know, I, I'm thinking about other works in the show right now, in that show that opens in the spring. And it's, uh, it's a, it more of a variety of works because John, you know, and this was his real passion, minimalist and conceptualist art. But he knew the McNeys collection probably as well if not better than most people and he really kept on top of what we were collecting and acquiring he loved our website and would would go on the browser almost every day to see what we had and when i was up there one day we were talking about warhol and you know warhol was not his favorite artist but i was arguing for the fact that you know like him or not he's you know an important part of the american canon of the 20th century and John, you know, we, we talked about Warhol a long time and then he called me up and he said, I bought two soup cans. And so the soup cans, you know, wound up as part of the bequest. So he knew that we were weak on Warhol. And I think, so the second, the second part of the, the, uh, the bequest, the second installment of the exhibition, I think will be about more about things that he saw that he thought maybe we needed, so. As, as I said, no one, no one really knew what John was doing in, you know, Windsor Road in Austin, Texas. No one had a clue of what was going on there, except for a couple of dealers, and maybe you know some curators at the, you know, at UT had caught wind of what was going on. But I don't think anyone up there really knew the extent, and certainly no one else in the in the state did. And uh, so, you know, it took us maybe 30 years to, <laughs> to get in there and to like, you know, make him trust. And I, trust was a big part of, of building that relationship, not only with John, but with any, with any collector who's, whose collection is sort of a part of them, part of who they are.